and get your guys' take on, you know, all of these things kind of coming together and what it means for foreign policy and um, how things might play out on the global stage in the next, um, you know, call it years to decades. Xi Jinping, it's been reported this week, is taking a trip to Saudi Arabia. You know, this is just a few weeks after uh, Joe Biden made his trip uh, to Saudi Arabia. I'll read a, just an excerpt. Um, he's going to end his more than two years of self-imposed in-person diplomatic isolation. And his first trip is going to be to Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, this is uh, from unnamed Saudi sources. So it's unclear. This isn't an official statement. Uh, this is just reporting. You know, it, the Wall Street Journal reported in March that after six years of negotiations, China and Saudi Arabia are getting close uh, for China to start pay, uh, um, uh, paying yuan uh, for oil that they would be buying from the Saudis. Um, so there's an important kind of economic tie up that may be emerging that, that could affect the U.S. dollar and the, uh, the importance of the U.S. dollar on, on the global economic stage. And meanwhile, this week as well, it's been reported that China is doing military exercises with Russia inside Russia. So there is um, an extension of China and their influence and their economic tie-ups and their military activity with both China, uh, sorry, with both Russia and Saudi. I also want to highlight another important point that came out this week. Uh, Saudi Aramco reported their earnings. The largest earnings ever for a company. $48 billion of net profit in a quarter. That is more profit than Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, and Tesla combined in a single quarter. It is the most profitable business. And Saudis have been very public about their intention of divesting their interest in Saudi Aramco, which is their state-owned and state-run oil company, and moving into other businesses. Over the past couple of months, um, it's been reported that they've accumulated a nearly $100 billion equity portfolio owning stocks like Alphabet, Zoom, Microsoft, and others. It's also been reported that they own over $160 billion of U.S. treasuries. So the U.S. is very dependent in the private equity community, in the VC community, and in the public markets on Saudi dollars. Saudis have been large holders of U.S. dollars. And now, through China, it looks like the Saudis may be having a tie-up that brings them closer to China it, through this trade relationship with the Yuan and the visit from Xi Jinping while China is actively exercising, um, you know, their military inside of Russia. Is the future a China, Russia, Saudi axis? And should we be concerned and should we be changing any of our tactics on foreign policy, David Sachs, as this, um, you know, set of threads plays out uh, over the next couple of months and, and you know, going ahead. Yes, I think we do need to make some changes. Biden's backing away from this now, but in his first year, he declared the Saudis be pariahs and he did push them into China's arms. What was the point of that? Biden recently had to go to the Middle East to basically beg Saudi Arabia to increase their production of oil. So he's already acknowledged that the policy didn't work. And one of the reasons it didn't work is because simultaneously with declaring these allies to be enemies, he basically restricted U.S. To, uh, energy production, which is, you know, str strategically and, undermined. So and, and the U.S. has military bases in Saudi Arabia, very strategic assets for the U.S. military. Yeah, listen. listen the, the, and we sell them weapons. The, the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia is always going to be complex. They're a complicated friend to have, but it's much better to have them as a friend than basically drive them into China's arms. And the reality is, whatever you think about the regime there and how oppressive it is, First of all, we don't get to choose the people running these countries. That's the lesson we should have learned over and over again from all these failed regime change operations. Second, do we have any reason to believe that if that regime got toppled, it would get replaced with something better? I think we all know that if the regime there fell, it would probably be replaced with something fundamentalist that we would like even less. And certainly if another nation were to basically dominate the region like Iran, that would be worse for us as well. So our relationship with them is complicated, but ultimately they should be, I think, allies of the United States, and we should not be working over time to push them into China's arms. And I think similarly with Russia, we've basically declared ourselves to be engaged in this proxy war with Russia, which strategically, there's just nothing in it for us. You can sympathize with the people of yeah. Ukraine all you want, yeah, but I mean, it's dangerous. You've said that in the past. I mean, I think the question is, does this China military exercise in Russia indicate an escalation of our conflict with China to you, um, you know, or is this something that, you know, is just kind of par for the course in terms of 
you know, uh, neighbors, you know, conducting. Mearsheimer just had an article in Foreign Affairs talking about uh, the Ukraine war, reminding us that it's still going on. I think people somehow think that this war is just stable and it'll settle into forever war status, kind of like, like Afghanistan, these conflicts in the Middle East that just went on forever. It's actually very dangerous. It could always escalate out of control. And as long as it's going on, I think we just have to remember that it's going on. It poses a huge global risk. And I would say that one of the things that, again, we should be aware of is this idea that even though we have problems and conflicts with multiple nations, we still don't actually want to push them into each other's arms. Again, the Soviet Union and China during the Cold War being the key example. I mean, this principle of geopolitics goes back thousands of years to the Romans, right? A divide et impera, divide and rule. You do not want to unite your enemies. And what we've done here is we keep pushing them together. You know, China and Russia historically have not been friends. They share long borders together. Neighbors generally have problems with each other. These are nations with serious conflicts or differences of interest. And we've made it really easy for China yeah. to, to turn Russia into the junior partner in that relationship. Tamat, do you think U.S. foreign policy needs to change and that we're setting up this, you know, um, axis of conflict, um, this, this axis of allies uh, that we don't want to have be allies? And, you know, would you kind of advise? And, and also, you know, do you get concerned about this oil yuan trade where there may be some, you know, economic tie ups that, that really could affect, uh, uh, you know, the, the dollar as a reserve currency? Look, a couple of things. I, I think it's really dramatic to kind of paint it in these stark kind of like bipolar terms. I think yeah. we are post all of that. So I, I understand how in the Cold War, it was easy to fall into binary definitions of good and evil, one and zero, us versus them, team A versus team B. But in 2022, I don't think that's how things work anymore. We're in a highly interconnected, highly global world. It's very complicated. Uh, dollar flows are real time. They're massive. Cooperation is real time. It's all over the world. It's with every country. So it allows every country actually the first chance that they've ever really had to maximize their own potential for their own citizens. And that's really what every country's goal is. Right. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. in that lens, look what just happened today. Gazprom said they're going to shut off Nord Stream one just for, you know, a few days, right? But as a result of that, EU nat gas has just gone absolutely nuclear and just closed at all time high. 14x, 14x where it was pandemic, right? Uh, you know, price so, per unit for year ahead. So if, you, if you so if you take a step back, we are at max energy production with all of the capacity all around the world, a hundred plus odd million barrels a day. Okay, global productivity absorbs that. There is very little room right now to expand that without pushing the date in which that capacity is available out until, you know, 2028 to 2030. So effectively a decade from now. So if you're in this situation and you're a country with vast natural resources, of which I'll just remind us America is one. I think the most important thing you can do for your own citizens is to monetize these petrochemicals now. Get it out of the ground in a reasonable way sell them in the marketplace because there's demand for it, take that money and reinvest it in your people. And I think if you look at it that way, the best run countries are responding to this moment in time like any company would. How do you maximize demand and sell the product you have to the most number of customers globally? And so I think the Middle East is doing an incredible job. The US, by the way, by passing the IRA, finally, I think, is on the right footing because and we can talk about this in a moment, but the path to permitting and the path to clean up. And by the way, it puts fossil fuels on a level playing field with, with clean energy alternatives, emerging alternatives. Yeah. The best thing that could have happened. Okay. So I think we're all behaving in a very rational market focused way. And so I would focus less on trying to, dramatically kind of resolve these things as a few countries versus everybody else. I don't think that's what's happening. Yeah, now, much more complex, much more complicated than that. But I think the, the simple explanation is people with resources in the ground of the country in which they rule have a responsibility if they believe that there's market demand to absorb that so that they can take the revenue that comes from it and reinvest it in their people. That is true for the United States. It's true for Saudi Arabia. It's true for every country in the world.
Yeah, Separately. I mean, Saudi Arabia is clearly making these investments, right? Not just on yeah. Know, and by the way, I energy, mean, like, but also housing and new industry and education. And then and what by do the way, you do Saudi, with Saudi that Arabia much money? Become, and Saudi Arabia is becoming much more liberal as a result too, right? The but, education and by the way, standards, yeah. And, and if you look at the investment, like you know, you didn't you you didn't need to go to Dave Swenson and understand portfolio allocation. Although I think the guys in Saudi are smart enough to have probably done it. But if you're if you have a lot of money coming from one kind of business. And you need to make sure that you can diversify so that you can reinvest over a long period of time. If you look at countries that had huge petrochemical related revenue flows, the Nordics, what did they do? They stood up these huge sovereign wealth funds. And those sovereign wealth funds went abroad, and they bought all kinds of non correlated assets to those petrochemicals. That is the same thing that Saudi is doing financial, now. Fin financial security for their people. But it's like, it's like, what is the yeah. furthest uncorrelated asset from right. oil? It turns out it's Apple, Facebook, Meta, and Google. Yeah. <laughs> and US, tre US Treasuries, yeah. 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 Uber. Yeah. Hey, J Uber. Uber. so JK, let me, uh, let me ask this contrarian question for you, because yeah. you, you often talk about the authoritarianism uh, of these states, Saudi, China, Russia. You know, it seems to me as we observe what's going on in, in Saudi, and maybe the case could be made in China to some degree, although there are steps taken back but also in Russia, that the US influence, the, the, the economic and the political influence associated with these, these foreign policy conversions, could they maybe be driving these, these, these countries to be more liberal? You know, we're seeing in, in Saudi oh, now that women can drive, that there's new industry, that there's education, that there's a technology industry booming, that the, you don't need to have a turnover of government and a turnover of what is often classified as authoritarian regime for the operating model to be influenced by the West in such a way that change happens more slowly. And you do see liberalism emerge in these countries with better educational standards, more equality, more, more human rights. And so do you think we're kind of, cause you often kind of paint a, a picture that it's bad guys versus us. You know, do you not think that we're making an, an influence on, on these places locally and that we're seeing? Well, I would, take exception to like, it's bad guys versus us. I don't I don't think we want to create a legion of dictators and nor do I think that's what this is. I would actually agree with Sachs, we should be embracing these folks um, and having strong relationships with them, even though we are fundamentally different uh, operating systems for our countries, democracy. So you think we should be embracing, we should be, you, you, sorry, you think we should have a relationship with Putin? Just a, a, a hundred percent. I mean, and yeah. we did, right? I mean, uh, yeah. Obama was making some progress on that. And we we did some great work. Um, when and obviously, Trump has a very, very long standing, very deep, we don't know exactly how deep relationship with uh, Putin. And we, we did great work with <laughs> we I mean, they did the he, he did his pageant over there. Okay. I'm making some jokes. They okay, bought a yeah. lot of apartments. Yeah, that, that, was a, that was a joke. Okay, go on. Just a little joke there. But who yeah, knows? A little little <laughs> we'll joke find out joke. over time, okay. I suppose. <laughs> okay. But we did great work with China in terms of containing North Korea's nuclear uh, ambitions, right? And so there are things we can collaborate on. I think the most important thing, though, is that while we are embracing them, building fabric between them, communication, trade, whatever it is, we are not relying on them. And, that, and that's really what we have to look at when it comes to the kingdom, because if not for the fact that the kingdom won the, you know, born on top of, you know, oil fields uh, lottery, we would not be uh, in a deep relationship with this country. They're living under a 10th century you know, rule uh, in terms of how they treat women, gay people, etc. And the human rights is an important issue. And we wouldn't have a deep relationship with them if we didn't have to deal with the oil, but we do. And so what I think we really need to be focusing on here is maintaining great relationships with them. Yeah, we don't want to drive them to each other's arms. But to Chamat's point, I, I don't think they're creating the legion of doom to take on the US. I think they're just doing what's in their economic interest. And we need to do what's in our economic interest, which really is investing in nuclear, investing in solar, batteries, wind, and, and, in and even bri the, and bridge and, fuels, and, 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 and in yes, what's of, in the interest yeah. of the free world and Europe, exactly. And if we are independent of them, then we don't have to go over there and kiss the ring like Biden had to do. We don't have to, you know, uh, deal with excuses uh, when they do horrible things like murder Khashoggi or, you know, just this past week, they put... Uh, Sama al Shahab in jail. She's a PhD student uh, from the University of Leeds. She's now going to go to jail for decades because uh, when she went back to Saudi Arabia on vacation, this happened last week, um, gentlemen, because she retweeted people. And so these human rights violations, the murder of Khashoggi, all these things add up, the Uyghurs, et cetera. And, and we'll have a better 
ability to negotiate and lead them as the shining city on the hill when we work on being that shining city on the hill and we're not dependent on them. And that's really what I think we have to focus on is reducing the dependency on these countries. I think we all agree, whether it's medical devices, PPE, drugs, making our iPhones or, or oil uh, to keep us. And then so does Europe. And that's where nuclear well, comes in.